Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Darcy Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of the American Planning Association and chair of APA's New Urbanism Division, and I am your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, July 19th, and we will be hearing the presentation, Incorporating Arts in Urban and Site Design. Get my screen to move. There we go. For technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar to the right of your screen. For your content questions related to the presentation, you can again type those in that box uh, located in the webinar toolbar, and we will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. On your screen coming up is a list of our sponsors for 2019. Thanks to all those participating APA chapters and divisions for making these webcasts possible and free to members. Today, in particular, today's uh, webcast is sponsored by the Urban Design and Preservation Division, and you will hear uh, from Margaret Rifkin in just a moment to talk a little bit more about them. So thank you for sponsoring today's webcast. Coming up on your screen is a list of our upcoming webcasts. Um, this is just through August, um, and we are planning September, October. You guys, we even have a couple sessions scheduled for November and December. So be sure to constantly check back on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast to get the latest and greatest information so you can register for our sessions. Today's webcast has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing only. You can log your CM credits by heading over to planning.org, logging into your My APA account, and then you can search via today's title or event number, and both of those can be found on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. Like I said, this is approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing only. We do have some recorded webcasts that are available for distance education. For more information on that, again, head over to our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. Let's be friends. Like us on Facebook, Planning Webcast Series, to again receive up-to-date information on our sessions. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. We have over 2,000, 2,500 subscribers right now and over 300 recorded sessions that are available for you. So head over there and uh, subscribe to us. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Margaret Rifkin of the Urban Design and Preservation Division to give some introductory remarks. Hi there. As Thank you, Christine. Um, as Christine said, I am the um, director of the Urban Design and Preservation Division's webcast series. And we would love to have you join the division if you haven't already. I'm assuming that most of you probably are members, but um, encourage your friends to join. Uh, we have a lot to offer, and you go online and check out our webpage. Um, also, we'd like you to see our publication. Uh, it's the result of our writing competition last year about creative placemaking. And um, I think Christine has another slide for us that shows the cover of that. It's a terrific publication. Um, the, it's got lots of images and lots of information about a variety of creative placemaking projects all over the world. And one of which won our prize at the last national uh, national conference for um, for our writing competition. Watch for our next webinar in this creative placemaking series. It will be coming September 6th and will be creative placemaking and the law again with the National Consortium for Creative Placemaking. With that, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Leonardo Vasquez, who is the executive director of the National Consortium for Creative Placemaking, a terrific organization. He is a national award-winning planner and the leader in two emerging fields in urban planning, creative placemaking and cultural competency. With that, welcome, Leo. Uh, hi, Margaret, and uh, thank you, Chris, and uh, so great to be with you, you all today. Uh, I am going to, okay, show my screen, um, and I'm 
I'm going to put up our slide. Give me a second here, because I I do a few things well, um, but I'm not a tech person. So, great. Can everybody see the slide? It looks great. Thanks, Leo. Okay. Terrific. Okay. Great. Um, well, as Margaret said, uh, i am uh, been a planner for about uh, two decades, primarily community economic development. And in the last uh, 10 years, I've uh, gotten into this, what, what's become a new field uh, called creative placemaking. It's a field, uh, really an, a new discipline within uh, uh, urban planning. And um, for those of you who are uh, schooled in uh, City Beautiful Municipal Art Movement, um, it's similar but but different, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> what we're going to do today is really think is talk about how can we be more strategic in incorporating arts into our practice. Um, the uh, you know we all like to have murals and uh, places for performances of you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and too many planners too many urban designers uh, unfortunately treat the arts uh, almost like decorative elements of course you know there's nothing wrong with with decorative elements but there's much more power there uh, with arts and cultural activities and we'll we'll talk about that and how you you know how you can be more strategic in uh, in your practice um, but before we go on I do just want to do a little um, a, a little plug for some of the work we do now I don't know how many of you have heard of the National Consortium for Creative Placemaking uh, when uh, People ask us what we do. We'll say, well, we do webinars like this and workshops and summits, and uh, we have a certificate program. But ultimately, what we do is related to what we try to achieve, and that is that we inform uh, professionals. We inform people who want to do this work. We inspire them to do better work. Uh, we empower them with uh, it, with knowledge, uh, with by helping them get connections, especially at our summit. And then we support them uh, by providing additional learning opportunities, by sharing information. If you become a member of NCCP, you get uh, a weekly newsletter that has uh, contract, RF, that has RFPs and uh, job opportunities. So, uh, you can go on to our site, cpcommunity.org, but I do want to just let you know about something that we're really excited about coming up. It's our next Creative Placemaking Leadership Summit. Uh, it's the two and a half day event, and it's going to be for the Midwest region. Now, it's going to take place in Cincinnati. I say it's for the Midwest region. Anybody from anywhere can go to the summit. It's one of the best places if you really are interested in arts and urban planning. It is one of the best places to go because you have grant makers, elected officials, developers, uh, people who are interested in this work and may be interested in working with you on art, incorporating arts into their urban and site design. Uh, also want to let you know that if you register by July 31st, it, the tickets are only $200 each. If you register afterwards, they, it becomes much more expensive. So um, please plan to uh, please plan to join us if you can. Okay, now uh, I'm going to start talking about creative placemaking and the way these webinars work is I do my presentation and then at the end I will take uh, questions. So you can write your questions in and then uh, uh, Christine will let me know, uh, will share with me the, the questions that, that have been asked. Um, so 
we're, we're all planners, urban designers. We've all studied City Beautiful, municipal art movement from the early 1900s, uh, late 1800s. What's different about creative placemaking? Well, our municipal art, City Beautiful looked at artwork, museums, and creative activities primarily as outputs. You know, let's let's put a statue there. Let's have a band shell over over here. Really, you know, it, it literally a superficial approach to working with the arts. Creative placemaking is as much about process as it is about output. The, you know, the and, and the reason this is important is because uh, artists, people who are trained in the arts, or even just have a very kind of a, are, are ex express themselves. And an artist is, in my definition, anybody who really expresses themselves in, in a creative way. It doesn't matter what the medium is. They have different ways of solving problems than the way we are trained. We are, as planners, we're trained to think in this very linear way. And artists, I, what I've found in my own work and other people have found, tend to be, um, tend to look at things, maybe not so much in a whole, you know, maybe they're not more holistic, but they're more open to, to looking at, uh, uh, you know, taking a side road and then coming back. Whereas, as planners, we're trained to kind of stay on you know the the you know stay on the main road um so it's what art does and what engaging artists does for us is it helps us become more creative in in our work now it is tough it it's it i could tell you it's a lot easier for us as planners to work with architects elected you know public officials uh, who are trained to think, you know, think through problems the way we, you know, in the same way, but um, it's it's worth it. And so, in creative placemaking, it's not just about producing more art, but also it being more artful in the way we are thinking about places. And so, uh, community art making, that is, doing a mural together and going through the process is not just a nice thing to do it's it's an important uh for us in terms of our problem solving ability and also in gathering data one of the we often don't talk about artists and community and data gathering but that's what what artists have the ability to do i think to some extent better than a lot of us do in our community engagement is to get people talking um, in such ways about deep issues, to really get at the root, at the DNA of our communities. And we, you can get information, you know, rich information about communities when people are engaged in festivals and art making and fun activities that you're not gonna get in a town hall or uh, or a, you know, a typical uh, charrette, um, you know, or a meeting where you sit, th where you stand up and say, what do you want to see? So anyway, um, this is the work of creative placemaking. Now, uh, the thing about creative placemaking is it basically has evolved anything with art. So how, you know, what is good creative placemaking? And here we look at six elements uh, to judge the, the value of our work. And I'm gonna start at the 12 o'clock position and go clockwise. Quality of life, are we enhancing quality of life for as many people as possible? Not just art patrons, uh, not just the person who's gonna spend $100 a ticket on a show or buy a $500 painting, uh, but that family, low-income family, uh, who you know don't consider themselves artsy? Uh, are they are their lives better off because of our intervention? Are we creating economic opportunity for people? Yes, 
uh, we know that if you put a theater, uh, you're going to create some restaurant jobs because restaurants are going to pop up around the theater. But is our work helping to enhance standards of living for other people? Are, are, are there indirect effects that are creating other opportunities, not just job opportunities, but entrepreneurial uh, opportunities? Shared leadership. Um, sometimes I will ask young planners, what's the purpose of community engagement activities? What's the purpose of having me? And I'll hear too, too often, it's to educate the public. No. Yes, no, that should not be the primary driver. Yes, that is important, but it's the education should be mutual. Uh, and this is where shared leadership is important. Talking about true collaboration where there is, where we are working together and there's shared credit, shared risk, shared reward, um, and shared blame. The, this is probably the hardest part of this work. Uh, the ideas are, e are easy. You bring people into a room and you ask them what they like, what they want. You'll come, you you know you'll come up with a whole bunch of ideas. And you ask, but the the challenge is how do you go from somebody should to we can to I will, and that's where the shared leadership comes in. Freedom and belonging is the idea that the work should enhance civil society. Um, and civil society is, a, is made better off when people feel freer, when they feel that they can express themselves, be who they want to be, and that they belong in the community, that the community values them, that it, is, it, that it, that they feel that they are home or at least part of the community. Um, you know, in today's society, uh, especially in immigrant communities and diverse communities, there are a lot of people who are feeling left out. Uh, there's always been people who feel left out, but I think there there are so many challenges, so many divisions now, and that, that get exacerbated um, through the various media that we we use. And so, the one thing that people can share is physical space and so it becomes so then our work when we accept that is not just simply about putting things in some kind of uh, order um, just you know just creating beauty but you know enhancing uh, creating the opportunities to enhance civil society and asset-based orientation is the idea that we work with what we have well, and that could mean uh, old buildings like what we are used to doing, but also thinking about the skills, the creativity that people have as assets. This, this goes back to the idea of community art making and um, where people, community members or participants are not simply audiences uh, or consumers of creative activities, but they are co-creators uh, as well and designers and a place-based orientation is the idea of let's build on let's understand what is distinct what is special about this place what makes this place different from other from the places next door and here again I go back to working with artists because we're used to looking at American Community Survey and census data and you know, and, and reading the written histories and, you know, of course, we put that in the front of our of our plans, you know, like two pages, but, you know, standard text. Um, but those things don't really tell a full story of, of a place. Working with artists, um, and I have some methods as well that, that are artistic methods, uh, and maybe you do as well. Uh, can really help us get to that information and understand what is special about the place. So it's not just um, 
preservation is not simply about what kind of physical objects we are preserved, but what are the cultural elements, what are the norms, behaviors, characteristics uh, uh, of that place that also should be preserved. Okay, now let's talk about urban design. We're going to put these into two categories. Uh, one category relates to artistic functions, that is uh, designed to enhance some kind of artistic, creative, cultural activity. Now you'll hear me use the word creative and culture in the same sentence, and technically they are distinct. Um, it, you know, you could say a heritage site is a cultural site, whereas a gallery is a, a music, you know, art gallery is a creative site. But why do I put those together? It's because local, because Local creativity, which is what we're looking for, because it's not simply just important porting something else, uh, because because of our place-based model, we want to grow what we have. Uh, local creativity is a reflection, or, or is I should say, is the reflections of uh, culture. Uh, culture, local culture, informs create creativity. So uh, I'm going to use those term, you know, I'll use those in the same sentence. I just want to explain why I'm doing that. So artistic functions, um, and there are four kinds that I'm going to highlight. Uh, performances, what we all think of, uh, you know, places for, vi um, you know, I was like, as, as the term suggests, you know, uh, places for performing arts. Exhibition, which are also marketplaces, art fairs, etc. Co-creation, which is a word that's not often used, but it's where we can work together to create something. And then individual creation, places that inspire people to do, to create their own art. Um, and then there's art. Then there's about art that's that's used to achieve certain social outcomes. Uh, one is uh, inspiration and healing, quiet places, uh, places where we can de-stress. Claim staking goes back to the idea of freedom and belonging. What, what do we like to see in our public art? We like to see ourselves or a better version of ourselves or what we care about. Navigation, just getting people around, which is one of the major functions of urban design. And then public safety. I'm going to now go into each one of these in detail. Performance spaces. What you're looking at here is a picture of the New Jersey Performing Arts Center in Newark, New Jersey. Um, this is a you know the, the classic space you know we all think about something with a with a stage whether it's permanent, temporary, um, and uh, an area for audiences. Um, some of the key design elements here are you want to make sure that there is there's no uninterrupt. I'm sorry, that there's uninterrupted space between the stage and the audience members. Now that seems obvious, but I will tell you, I have seen uh, people try to do performances in parks where there's trees in the way or where if it's an electrified performance, there's the, the audio booth and it's, and it's blocking people's views. Now these spaces, uh, you know, we tend to see these spaces um, in parks, in plazas, usually there's some kind of band shell or a gazebo, some kind of raised element that's a centralized element for people to look at. The fact is that these could be in any kind of space where you have uh, uninterrupted viewing and where you can elevate the performance, the performers uh, above the, the audience, or where the or in the case of let's say a natural amphitheater, where the audience is actually elevated above the 
uh, the the stage area. And then when you look at a typical Olmstedian home, park, that's what you you might see in the northeast, where you have uh, you know rolling areas. But there's certain considerations. Uh, if you're going to do this in a dense an urban area, you really have to think about the context. Um, you know, if, let's say you want to use a vacant lot for some performance. Are we looking at, you know, what's nearby? Is it residential? You know, it, is it a place where people open their windows at night, especially in the warmer weather? In the warmer weather, or is it where they have hermetically sealed windows? And because everybody loves the idea of concerts, unless you don't like the music, and then you hate it. Um, so, what would you do then if you wanted to do, a, a, you know, performance space in a dense area, let's say in a vacant lot? Well, you might make it smaller. Uh, you might design something that is not will not attract large crowds because the larger the crowd that you try to attract, the more likely it is that the performer is going to need to uh, amplify the voices, which means more. Uh, means more noise. So you could do something small, maybe something that is for 20 or 30 people rather than 200 people. Um, another thing that I would recommend is if you're working in an urban park system, an urban plaza area, uh, consider the fact that if you have, if you, even if you put it in a park, uh, let's say you, if you have something that amplifies the sound waves, let's say a band shell, it's going to carry, if, if you design it for a large audience, like a great lawn tech thing, it's going to carry a long way, which means that uh, you're going to have ish, noise issues. So you're going to want to consider uh, some sound barriers between the the performance area and uh, any kind of residential areas uh, or business areas as well. Um, now we all like the idea of downtown business, you know, of, of having you know concerts downtown. That's very common in, in cities, but uh, you know, consider the fact that if you have, you know, if, if the buildings, if you have older buildings. Uh, where people open their windows, it it might interfere with with uh, business there. So, you know, consider all of these elements. Now, what I will say is absolutely important is don't just plop a performance space somewhere. Okay, consult with with people in the performing arts. Uh, they have very good sense of site design. Uh, it's practically intuitive for them because they know how to, you know, th they have to organize it. Um, work with audio engineers, test the, test the sound, look at how the sound reverbs, you know, it, can it be, you know, is it muffled, uh, can, can it be controlled or is it, is it because of all the hard surfaces, is it bouncing around and then uh, creating the potential for, uh, uh, for problems with, uh, nearby businesses and residences. Okay, take a break. It now a similar space is exhibition. Now exhibition is also another way of saying a marketplace. And one thing to know about everybody who works as an artist, who anybody who tries to earn at least some income as an artist is a small business and what do small businesses need they need access to markets now if you happen to be uh living working in you know manhattan in in la and um you know lar in a central in its downtown of a large uh, city then yeah you have a large market but most of us don't most of us are working in smaller communities and um, or even in neighborhoods where of larger communities where we don't get a lot of people coming in. So 
this, these exhibition spaces create that marketplace. Again, large areas, uh, you know, flat areas are good because you, you don't want the, you, you don't want to put things on an angle and then, you know, have the merchandise slip off the tables. But the key difference here with exhibition and performance spaces is that you want to have large vertical elements within the, uh, the space it, itself. With the performance space, you want it, your large vertical elements, you'll want to have those at the edges of the space. Here, you'd want to have those towards the middle as a way to guide people towards, uh, as, as a way of, of doing, you know, building paths for, for people. Um, I would, here, you could certainly do, if it's a temporary uh, site, like in this case, the Epic New York Art happening. This appears to be on a in a park lawn on looks like somewhere in Brooklyn. Uh, you could do these temporary little pop up uh, vertical elements, uh, such as what you see the Freeze Art Fair. But if you're looking at becoming more of a permanent uh, space for exhibition marketplace, then you want to create spaces for large for for tall visual art um you know various uh, you know spread out uh, around the the space now here's a, a different type of space so the the first two are the spaces that we're all very familiar with the performance space the exhibition space you may have, you probably have designed spaces like that or or at least have in your plan incorporated uh, those kinds of spaces now this is uh a, a different kind of space and this one i want to get into a little more of the design elements here uh, so a space for co-creation uh, so much of our work is collaborative uh, so you know a lot of you know good creative work can be can be collaborative tip you know traditionally people come together in a studio in a bar or something the uh, you know star the local starbucks but we can create open spaces that can generate those same kinds of activities. And to do that, we want to think about uh, smaller spaces, and they could be, let's say, a vest pocket park like you see up at the top picture there. Um, but what we want to do is create a sense of, of rooms. And so you could see in the, the picture there, that it's the the park itself is a little bit sunken uh not not in a big way not not in a way that hides anybody but just enough to create a sense of a room and then you can use foliage and some vertical elements like the those decorative bollards there uh to create a sense of a wall and you want to have furniture that encourages people to look at one another. So things like circular tables, you know, the circular park, you know, the benches, uh, let's say circular benches, or even if you have um, the seating, you can have seating that is curved rather than, than straight. Um, certainly, uh, you know, you'd wanna have movable chairs if possible. That's always a good idea in any kind of public space, but especially here in the, co-creation spaces um, and I'd like you to look at the bottom picture you can also have tools that inspire creativity that encourage people to to go and have fun now, what you're seeing down in the picture below are outdoor instruments the uh, the xylophones there's the things that look like smokestacks those are wind Harps, you, you bang them and the noise comes out. Uh, there's, there's drum sets. Now they do these for the kids, but honestly, everybody loves them. And it's just, you know, the thing about being creative is you gotta have fun with it. If you're not having fun, you're not doing it right. So you can have these these objects. I mean, they do need to be replaced probably every 10 years or so, but it's worth it. It makes people smile, encourages people to to go there. 
Now, the, the park that you're seeing up at the top picture, that's in South Orange, New Jersey. And in fact, that park is so well used and it is so, people feel so connected to it that when there is a tragedy, such as the, uh, the shootings at the synagogue in Pittsburgh last year, uh, this is the place where people in South Orange come together to grieve. So it's a space for co-creation, but it also becomes a, you know, it, because it's so well designed and so well used, it's also an important uh, community uh, space. Now, individual creation, you know, the classic sort of artist taking out their palette and, and painting. Um, I'm showing you two examples, uh, two types of example. One is kind of a big open space, uh, the plein air painter. Um, and you want to have, you know, you want to have some nice view sheds for people. You, you want to create vistas. Now, I know we're not, we may not all be landscape architects, so I'm not asking you to be landscape architects, but at least thinking about uh, the, those elements. Um, the other is a more urban uh, artist, and we can't tell, we don't know who's going to do what. You know, uh, some people need that quiet space. Some people love the energy of, a, uh, of, a, of an urban setting. But there are things that we could look at, you know, we could consider for both of them. Again, that sense of a wall. Now, we don't see it with the top picture. This is a picture shot from behind. But if you look at the bottom pictures, you see how these artists use the street elements. Uh, well, in the, case of, uh, in the case of the artist on the right, he's using a permanent element um you know that railing as as a wall and he's using a a portion of the sidewalk that probably isn't used much for navigation in the picture on the left you see how the artist has made her gallery into a wall to protect her or to feel a sense of protection from the the street now, in both of these cases, uh, if you're going to do this, you want to make sure that your public right-of-way, your, your sidewalks are uh, designed, have at least 60 inches of clearance after you allow for space for the, the uh, artist. Uh, so what you're looking at is probably maybe thinking about doing some bump outs uh, to expand the the width of the sidewalk, expand the, nav the navigation. They, you know, either the artist could be on the bump out, or the or you can encourage people to sort of snake around the artist. But you, it's it's so important that you leave that navigation um, open. Now, if you don't have that kind of uh, space on a particular sidewalk, uh, the next best thing you could do is to create a parklet, which is taking a, a parking space and repurposing it, at least temporarily, uh, for something else. Um, could be a stage, could be just a, um, uh, could, you could just put a pallet and it could just be a blank area. But the idea is that you're extending the width of the, the, the sidewalk. Uh, for some kind of communal purpose. Okay, now let's get into artful place making. That is the you the engagement of art and being and for social uh, urban design purposes. Let's first look at a space for inspiration and healing. Quiet spaces. If you've ever been to a hospital and I you know, unfortunately too many of us have been to, to a lot of hospitals, you'll see these spaces. Uh, they're quiet, they might, they, and what they typically have is some kind of, usually you know, some nice floral display, some benches. Um, it tends to be 
small. Um, it's designed really for people to, to gather in, to be alone or to gather in very small groups. Um, but these spaces don't just have to be for hospitals. I mean, we have so much tension in our lives, especially in urban areas, that it is, it's great to create these spaces in urban, um, in downtown settings. So how do we do that? Well, what we want to think about is, you know, incorporating natural elements when possible. So it could be something as simple as some nice flowers and flower pots or something like do, taking a wall in a vacant lot and making it into uh, uh, doing a water feature there. Uh, the artwork should be quiet should be uh, not simple, that's not the right word, but it should not try to be vibrant. We've seen these murals with a lot of colors and a lot of action. That might be great art for performance spaces, you know, other kinds of places, co-creation, but not for this kind of, of space. What we want for this kind of space is something that allows people to focus. If you've ever done meditation, you know how important, how critical it is that you're able to, to focus. So this one, this picture is from Grounds for Sculpture in Hamilton, New Jersey, which is a, a great uh, sculpture garden. And uh, what I love about this picture is the, you know, what you can see is it's not just one work, it's one work of art. It's, it's kind of these, it looks almost like a ruin there. It's really, totem so you can focus on one or two uh, elements and then it's surrounded by those those water features uh, now claim staking let's go back to that what I said about freedom and belonging how do you encourage that well you get more of a sense of freedom and belong people feel a, a greater sense of freedom and belonging when they can see themselves or what they want represented in the community. Hence the two pictures there. Now the picture above is from uh, Redmond, Washington. There's the uh, the tree sweaters. There's a group of people who uh, take yarn and knit them around tree. You've probably seen this in in other in other places. And by the way, it does not harm the tree. It's, it's perfectly fine. Now you think, how is this claim staking? This is what what kind of message is this sending? Well, it's just sending a message that hey, we're having fun. This is a fun place. This is my stuff. You know, this is something that's going to make you smile and makes me smile. We feel good here. And ultimately, what we're about is influencing how people feel and how they behave in an environment. So public art doesn't have to be serious. It could be whimsical. In fact, one thing I would say is that you can't have too much fun with public art of any kind. I mean, have you ever been to a, have you ever been in anywhere where somebody said, oh, I gotta get out of here, I'm having too much fun? No. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, there is there are times and places for serious artwork, uh, for monumental artwork, but you know, the fun stuff. People, you know, some people are going to complain. People go, "I oh, graffiti," blah, blah blah blah. You know, most people enjoy it. If it makes them smile, they feel good. They're going to stick around. Now, uh, murals are a great way for people to represent themselves, represent their, um, to tell stories of, of themselves, of the place. And in fact, one of the things that, if we go back to, to the, those uh, old European churches, um, you know, you'd see this, all this wonderful artwork in these, in these old Catholic churches. Now, that was done, the, the church at the time, when they were doing this in the Middle Ages and later on, a lot of people were illiterate. A lot of people, and because of the old ways of the, the, the Catholic Church, 
a lot of people didn't read the, the Bible. They were told what the Bible said. So the artwork helped to tell the story of the Bible. Today, our murals, our artwork, help to tell the stories of the people and the place that the people are in. Um, what I would recommend as designers is that we identify spaces for this to occur, but that we are not the people who design the artwork it itself. The stories should be told by people but people in the community working with artists who can best represent their stories. And um, there's a, something that we do called crowd mapping. You may have heard about it in, in different ways, but engaging people in mapping areas that could be opportunity sites for public artwork. Uh, that, that could, that's a longer conversation and a different conversation. So, Let's go to navigation. Uh, if you, there's a great book by Tony Hiss, formerly of the New Yorker, called *The Power of Place*, um, and it's it's a great book for urban designers, for all planners, really. One of the things he says there is that people like to be surprised, but they don't like mystery. So, what artwork like you see? Uh, here in these images, what they help, they help create a sense of, of the path. Uh, they are, uh, they are landmarks. Um, I mean, I'm not going to go into the whole, you know, Kevin Lynch thing. You, you all know that stuff. And, uh, but, you know, think about it more than just decorative. Think about it as a way to, uh, to create to encourage people to, to walk on certain paths. In fact, I've, I've developed, I, I use the term artways, where let's say we have a corridor and we want to encourage behavior, you know, pedestrian behavior, um, using sequential art to encourage people to move uh, another step uh, further. You know, art that's you know, at least no more than 750 feet uh, from one, work of art to, to another, uh, so that it isn't, you know, so when you're looking at one piece of art, you can see another and you know, the, essentially serving the purpose of breadcrumbs. Okay, now the last thing I want to talk about, and then we'll get into the questions, uh, design using artwork for safety. Um, that that fine looking, Dalmatian is in Shreveport, Louisiana, and when you touch them, the colors change. Uh, it's a fun thing. It's a landmark. Um, it it creates a sense. It helps create a sense of safety because not only do you have, you know, you have more light, but also people have a place that they can go to to meet uh to you know if they if they're in any kind of trouble that they can say i'm near this um and it also because it is whimsical because it makes people smile it also helps this kind of art helps to send the, tell the story that you know this is a, a safer you know if you think this is dangerous it's not as dangerous as you think it's you know, because if you're laughing and you're smiling, it's, you, you can feel more comfortable. Um, what you see below the picture, uh, this is underpass art, uh, you know, wherever you have uh, highways, elevated highways, or uh, elevated tracks, like in uh, Chicago, and you have dark spaces. These, of course, as you know, are, can can serve as significant edges and barriers to activity. So using things like uplighting, uh, bright colors, uh, reflective surfaces such as, such as mirrors can certainly help with those elements. And in fact, if you wanna see some great examples uh, I, of this, 
I would Google underpass art, and you could see some incredible, you know, some wonderful examples of of work that helps to turn uh, an ugly old underpass into a, essentially a an interactive art exhibit. Okay, so um, I think that's a lot there, and I think we can. Um, Maybe stop here, and then maybe uh, you know I could take questions or comments. Um, and by the way, if you have, um, you know, I'm sure that that some of you have experience doing, you know, working, designing around these kinds of spaces. So if you want to comment on your own experiences, that's that's fine too. We, I believe very strongly in peer sharing. Great, thanks, Leo. Uh, again, if you have questions for Leo, just type those in the chat box in your webcast toolbar. So our first question, from a public health standpoint, how does incorporating, oops, hold on, my screen just messed up. Uh, from a public health standpoint, how does incorporating art into urban design help? Well, a couple of ways. So let's take mental health. Spaces for inspiration, the inspiration healing spaces, are important for people to de-stress. Um, the uh, I think it particularly in um, in lower income areas where people are stressed all a lot, and areas where there's issues of public safety. Um, the uh, uh, you know the getting people to smile, uh, getting people to feel comfortable in a place uh, certainly helps on the mental health side. Um, I would encourage if, you, if one of your purposes is to, to enhance mental health is to do a lot with botanics, with, with greenery. Uh, people tend to concentrate better, people tend to feel more relaxed in environments with a lot of greenery. For physical health, um, what art, public art can do is encourage, is part of an act, active design, is I mentioned before the art ways, that if you create paths that have interesting, you know, surprising, interesting elements, it encourages more people to, to walk. Um, there's, you know, there's artwork. We, we often think about public art as being something that has to just be viewed, but that's not necessarily the case. You think about place sculptures, things that you could put in the environment that encourage people to walk on, to 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 step to step on. I mean, the, the musical instruments gets you to you know gets you to move your your arms and. Um, and interact with with other people, and um, the uh, uh, you know we one of the big area issues, especially in um, communities with a high you know with a large percentage of elderly people or uh, recent immigrants, is social isolation, uh, which becomes a mental health issue, which also then has a physical health implications and so having spaces co-creation spaces having spaces that people can come together um, where they're not being forced or being told that they have to buy something or get out like in a typical store or, or bar um, can certainly help reduce that isolation now I want to be very clear, it is not a build it and they will come situation, all right? Uh, when you are designing these public spaces with, you want to design them with the people who are gonna be doing the programming. Uh, do not design them in, in, in isolation and just expect that somebody's going to, that something is gonna happen. Uh, so, so that's probably the most important, the most important thing I could, I could say there. But thank you for that question. A 
Okay, thanks. Um, we're getting several questions about wh where's the line drawn? How far can we go? Um, so the first one is, do cities allow those tree sweaters and other claim staking demonstrations or is there a process for approval? So can people just kind of go out and, and do these types of, of demonstrations as they want or should there be some type of process to have a little oversight? It, it depends on it depends on your local ordinance um, and ordinances, and also, quite frankly, on um, your elected officials. Uh, the kind of tree sweaters. I don't know that there's anybody who's got a, uh, a tree sweaters. This is all part of something called yarn bombing, where you where you wrap things up in yarn. I, I don't know that anybody's got a perm special permit for yarn bombing um the uh it, often what happens and the reason it's called yarn bombing is it's done as guerrilla art work uh, the uh, that that people will go out in the middle of the night and they'll put this on and you know some people get outraged other people say wow this is great in any case it becomes you know at least it starts a conversation now the key thing is that um, usually, if it's temporary art, a temporary installation, something that could be pulled up, it's not a big deal. The problem comes when it's something more permanent. And for example, in murals, um, there are in, in some communities, and I can tell you, there's one we worked in, Perth Amboy, New Jersey, where murals were illegal because whoever was whoever wrote the ordinance. Uh, the graffiti ordinance decided that anything that wasn't a commercial sign would be uh, it, it should be considered graffiti and therefore illegal. So what a group of people in that city did was to create a permitting process for murals, and the process was where somebody would, you know, fill out a short form, and then the mural. Uh, and there would be certain standards, like let's say no nudity, no obscenity, um, and the the permit would be reviewed by the municipal arts council. Um, and uh, you know, just like with a planning board, it's not about. Uh, oh, I shouldn't say. Let me step back. It's not about necessarily the content to say I like this image, I don't like that image, uh, but does it meet the community standards that that are explicitly set forth. Um, so I, I may this may not be a direct answer, but the um, it, it's what happens is that you unfortunately what happens is that you you can't the determine you can't predict creative output you can't really you can't tell artists what to do what to, you mean you can tell them what to do it they can tell you where to go <laughs> but what you do is you create the environment as both a physical environment and social environment so you know if you have artists who do a guerrilla art project um, such as a yarn bombing and you know it's the mayor is getting calls from people who go oh this is terrible this is the worst thing ever you can explain to them why it's important that these this activity occurs um, and um, and how we will benefit. Now, what, more and more, what's happening with uh, communities is that the it becomes a community project that people will, will go to the you know local elected officials, go through the local arts, and say, hey, we want to do this on the public square. And you know, then it's then it's okay. But sometimes, you know, sometimes you'll, you know, it's up to you whether you want to allow artists to have their say. Now, the picture you're looking at and the thank you, that is a piece of guerrilla art in the Lower East Side that was not sanctioned by the city of New York. That is a, an artist who, and I don't remember if. if 
who did it. But that particular artist decided to take it upon themselves to to turn uh, that light pole into uh, a frame, you know, a, a canvas for a mosaic. Um, I, I'm not sure if I answered the question well, but I, I tried to answer the question as honestly as I could. <laughs> um, you touched on it uh, for a moment about not being able to necessarily tell an artist what to do. Um, w there are several questions, you know, wh how, what can we do to draw the line on art that's really inappropriate uh, outside of, you know, pu putting it in some kind of contract, nothing like this, nothing like that. At the end of the day, it's probably a lot up to interpretation. Have you had any experience or heard any stories of situations um, where one's interpretation of art is a little different than another's, particularly in the light of uh, what's deemed appropriate for public? Uh, again, go, the, what's deemed appropriate for the public depends on your local state ordinances. Um, what is considered, let's say in Florida, lewd and lascivious. Um, you should not try to go beyond that. We do not, as, as designers, as planners, it's not our job to, to determine content. It's our job to create the environment. Now, there, so there are laws, every community has laws about obscenity, uh, about lewdness, what you can do in public, what you can't do in public. And so those become the, the guidelines. Now, now, if the concern is whether something is appropriate or inappropriate uh, for the community, the best way to make sure that something is acceptable to a community is to have the community involved in the art making. Um, they may not be involved in the design, but they you know, getting them involved in thinking about the themes and thinking about the elements. Now, you work with a good social practice artist or civic artist, somebody who's experienced in working uh, with communities, who understands that the art is not simply what they create, but what we all create together. Um, you're not going to have those issues, or, or you're less likely to have those, those issues, because people community members become a moderating effect. Um, where there's often problems is where a, uh, a private property owner uh, decides they want to put something up and hire somebody without any community engagement and people get, people get upset. Now, what happens is some, People sometimes get upset because it's just different. Montclair, New Jersey, uh, about 15, 20 years ago, the owner of a French restaurant decided that it would be a great idea to have a mural of a rooster on the side of his restaurant or her restaurant. I, I forget uh, the restaurant, restaurant tourist name. And at first people were shocked. How could this possibly be in a suburb? Uh, mural of a giant chicken or a giant rooster. So, well, now this thing is a lovable object. This thing is a landmark in town. It gets it, it gets accepted. Um, there's one town, and I won't mention the town, but there was a mural done, uh, and it showed uh, this is a town where it's rapidly changing. It was pre predominantly white. It's becoming much more Latino. A mural was commissioned, and um, there were, you know, there was one of those, you know, mur murals with pictures of kids or, or, you know, paintings of kids. And look, the main kid happened to be brown skinned. And this caused a certain amount of furor in the, in the community. You know, people using the words, you know, when they don't like something, they'll use the two G words. They'll say ghetto or graffiti. Well, this is something where, in our work as as the, you know as planners, we have to say, well, what's our obligation? Is our obligation to uh, do we have more of an obligation to promote social justice or to support or or to 
uh, uh, appeal to to calm the the concerns of people who may have uh, may be prejudiced. So, uh, bottom line is the more you involve people, and the you know if you commission artists who have who are good at working with communities, the less likely that you you're going to to have problems. However, we know that 5% of the people will vote against the sun shining in the morning. So you put something new in the urban environment, something different, somebody's going to complain about it. And that's not a bad thing because it starts a conversation. Um, and at least the conversation is, is, is valuable. It, it, if nothing else, it gives you greater insights about what's going on in the community. Thank you. We have several questions about how to protect against graffiti and vandalism of a public art installation, whatever kind of installation it might be. Help. How can we avoid it? What can we do? Well, going back to uh, involving community members, people tend to nurture what they create. Best example. Philadelphia Mural Arts Program, uh, the the gold standard for for community murals in the in the United States, probably around the world. Uh, their approach is very collaborative, very community oriented. They've done more than three thousand works of art, or they commissioned, they helped create more than three thousand works of art. Only a handful of them have ever been vandalized. People tend to nurture what they create. The artwork that tends to get vandalized in the community is artwork that may not reflect community interests. Um, I, uh, I, I'm thinking of years ago, well, not years ago, but you know, maybe 10, in Trenton, New Jersey, Colonial City, they did murals and it was, as you'd expect, with a historic colonial city, there's a lot of murals of dead white people doing colonial stuff. Um, I, 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 I'm sorry, if I were talking about historic preservation, for those of you who are <laughs> preservationists, you're probably aghast at how I put it. But I mean, it, 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 it's important, it's, you know, but it, it was basically the same thing, you know, people that try corner hats, and, you know, with the muskets and, you know, um, now, Trenton is a city that is predominantly uh, African-American and Latino. And the people, a lot of the people didn't see themselves in these murals. I'm not surprised when I found that some of the, these murals were vandalized. Um, but there are other types of artwork in Trenton and they are taken care of. So, Again, uh, people people are moderating effect. People uh, people nurture nurture if it's done with with them. Um, and you know what? If a, if work is repeatedly vandalized, again, this is data for us. We're saying, well, are there? We somebody has to some somebody has to be upset enough about a piece of artwork to want to vandalize it. So instead of just saying, oh my God, how do we avoid graffiti on, is we look at, well, why is this, uh, why is this artwork being vandalized? Um, is there something new? Is there something changing in our community that we're not aware of? The Philadelphia Mural Arts Program, interestingly, began as an anti-graffiti program. Uh, the mayor back in the early, I believe, 90s went to um, uh, the director um, and uh, said, you know, we got to get these kids to stop graffiti. Let's do some kind of art program with them. And you know, she found that they were really, really talented people who wanted, who needed, who wanted to express themselves and couldn't find a place that allowed them to express themselves in the, in the public. And so 
that's how the you know that's how the community mural really started in Philadelphia. Thank you. Okay, let's shift a little and let's talk about transportation and roads, cars, buses, and how we can incorporate them into public art. I know you mentioned and showed pictures of an underpass that was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So what could you could you dive a little deeper into that? We've had several questions sure. from folks wanting to know how we can do it and and safely so that you know we're not in inhibiting views or installations are accidentally falling on cars or people or whatnot. Yeah, dive deeper if you could. So it the so here we want to think about what's our purpose. So for example, if we are let's say we are designing an intersection where we want to do some traffic calming. Um, there we'd probably want to do uh, some painted crosswalks. Uh, we would want to do uh, maybe some lighting. Uh, I mean certainly we could we could do some neck down. Uh, I mean that's not that's not artful necessarily but uh, Creating that space for for some kind of a public art to 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 happen. Um, I mean, we we want to be careful uh, for safety purposes that we're not inhibiting visibility. So the artwork uh, may be elevated, um, or it may be if we're going to do vertical artwork, it should be something that's narrow, so it it doesn't in, it it doesn't uh, in, inhibit sight. Um, and uh, you know, let's say if it's a if it's an area that is not well lit, uh, you know, we have intersections that are not well lit. We could use artistic lighting as a way to to create some kind of you know brighten the area a little bit, um, and also create <coughs> excuse me a sense of safety uh, for for people. Now, I will tell you that. The traffic engineers, the transportation planners, some of them can be a tough nut to crack with this. Uh, the Federal Highway Administration has these regulations about painted crosswalks that are just, I, I've read them and I, some of them are just, are, are just ridiculous, uh, quite frankly. Um, for example, never using purple in a the color purple in a crosswalk. I have no idea why. I mean, I, I've never heard of a case where somebody saw the color purple on the street and suddenly drove 70 miles an hour and killed a bunch of people. Um, so, you know, the, these kinds of things, um, the, the key is that, you know, people say, well, if you did put these elements there, then it's, you know, it's distracting. But actually having these elements, these visual elements, by having the driver look at a bunch of things, rather than being distracted, it tends to slow them down. It's when you have elements that are easily overlooked that the driver just goes quickly past them. Uh, so having something that's new in the environment can, can help. So that's in you know, a particular case of, of uh, you know, creating pedestrian safety. Um, you know, in on highways, um, you know, you certainly want to be careful about having artwork that is so complex or so involved that it does take, that it does distract the, the, the driver. Uh, there's a, an, on the New Jersey Turnpike, there's, there's this, um, thing called American Dream. It's been this huge mall, you know, big, huge project that's been languishing for years and years and years. Um, well, the original design for it, the architect was going to have these blinking lights uh, that you could see along, you know, the, all this, like this huge panel of blinking lights that you could see along the, the turnpike. A ridiculous notion. The last thing you want people to do when they're driving 65 miles an hour is to turn their heads and look at a bunch of blinking lights. Um, that That is just, whoever thought that idea was a 
moron, and whoever approved that idea was even a bigger moron, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and if you're in the audience today, you should apologize for it. But you're probably not in the audience today, so that's why I don't mind saying that <laughs> people are more. But um, the but there you could certainly use art that is uh, that is more passive. So what you see in New Mexico, Arizona, you see these wonderful uh, sound barriers. No, the sound barriers are wonderful, but but you see this very sort of nice decorative art. So it's not boring, but it's also not uh distracting hmm. now for transit centers uh you definitely want to have art there um very few people have to take a train have to take a bus that was always true but it's even more true now that you have ride check where you um so you want to make the transit area a a better experience for the people who are who are there um, and you know bus stations are some of the most depressing places to be i mean we we used to think about this you know train stations as these grand entrances and that's fine but bus stations are also entrances for people um usually for lower income people and they are so many of them are just so terrible um and what message does it send to people when they go into a place and it's just awful? What a message does it send to, you know, I, I know what message it, it would send to me as somebody riding the bus is saying that, that we, you know, our community doesn't care about you. Our community doesn't even want you here. We want you if, you're, if you've got the money to ride the train because we make this nice entrance for you. So absolutely want to have, you know, you know, uh, for, from an equity standpoint, um, I would spend more time doing uh, public artwork at bus stations than I or at bus stops than I would at you know at other types of transit. So I'll I'll jump off my soapbox now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, regarding interactive public art. What do we have to be worried about? Do, you know, is, is there an, an uh, increased liability? What types of things should we take into consideration? Their location, things like that. You know, I, I love talking with planners because the first thing they, you know, it's it's like, what do I have to be scared of? Well, it's true. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's true. We're a little pessimistic um, sometimes. <laughs> we we are. I know. I know. We 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 are all about managing risk and. You know, we think about what what could go wrong. For for interactive art, um, you definitely want to, you know, um, you you ideally want to have this interactive art in places where there are a lot of people, where you have eyes on the street, um, and frankly, that's where the artist is going to want uh, the 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 artwork itself um you uh you, you know you should have something that's simple um so there's an artist named candy chang uh that some of you may have heard of and she does these uh called before i die uh interactive art where it's basically like a giant chalkboard and people you know she writes before i die and people are encouraged to write down uh an answer um you know most people the vast majority of people are going to be good they're not gonna they're gonna not gonna do terrible things especially with you know um yeah you, you might get some 12 year old boy who draws a penis on on a you know on a piece of art and then you erase it you know it's not not that big a deal um, but uh, the thing about any of this interactive art is you have to manage it. It's not going uh, it, to, you can't just set it and forget it, you know, to sort of uh, quote uh, some TV commercial. Uh, the artist isn't going to want you to set it and forget it either. 
I mean, the purpose of the interactive art is uh, to get people to interact with it, and you have to, and you want to monitor it. Um, so uh, you can, uh, if uh, you know, you'll you'll need to talk to the engineers. Like, if you want something that people are going to climb on, you know, let's say some kind of sculpture that that's okay for people to climb on, you'll certainly want to have soft surfaces. Around you know you don't want you don't want to put it on a sidewalk. Um, you might want to put it in a park with some soft soft grass around, so that if somebody falls, they, you know they they're not going to break their head. Um, if it's uh, artwork that is designed to get people to to express themselves, um, you're going to want to go back there and. Once people have filled up the board, you're going to want to erase it anyway and to give more people a chance to fill up. So, uh, you know, I think in terms of um, the what to be careful about, um, you're not going to be asking people to climb a replica of the Eiffel Tower, you know, 30 feet up in the air. Um, if we're talking about sculptures that people climb on, we're talking about things that maybe at the most it's a few feet off the off the air, so uh, off the ground, I should say. So uh, you know, you can talk with your 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 local engineer, but it's not really that big 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 of a uh, a problem. Thank you. You know, I I know I know it's uh, it, I I know it's probably not. The most professional answer, as one planner to another, to say, "Don't worry about it," but don't worry about it. Okay, we'll come back to you when we <laughs> have a problem and say, "You told me." Yeah, yeah no, I'm going to be sued by somebody who broke their head. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> to continue a little bit of the the conversation of interactive public art, there are several questions from folks wanting some good examples of art that incorporates either the time of day um, or the current weather, you know, uh, installations that might change throughout the day or throughout the year, and also then installations that can handle uh, daytime, nighttime, snow, rain. Do you have examples of any art that, you know, sort of moves to the weather or to the time of day? I I don't I mean I'm not I I'm not an expert on specific types of public art. Um, I would recommend going to our our friends at Forecast Public Art. Um, have for the last forty years have been documenting uh, different types of of, uh, of of public artwork. Um, I would uh, rec also recommend reaching out to your local state arts agencies because um, they they're people who know about what kind of public art is in your uh, uh, in your in your community there's so many variables there I, I don't yeah I, I don't know the you know, environmental constraints but you know something that might work in um, in New England uh, or something let's say something that might work in Scottsdale Arizona, might not necessarily work in Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, so that, that's where that's where I would. Uh, those are the two first places I would go. Um, also, a great resource is Americans for the Arts, AFTA.org. Um, they are the nation's leading arts advocacy group, and uh, they have uh, Patricia Walsh is I, I think the Director of their public art initiative, and she would be, uh, you know, look her up. She's she'd be a great resource there. Thank you. We obviously need to have a webcast specifically for this because there there were at least seven or eight people asking about that. <laughs> um, well, this question will get you. What do we do in a community that isn't interested in public art and feels that? there are more important things that we should be trying to spend our money, our resources, our time, our public input in. What do we do? What do we say? How do we convince them? 
Well, it depends. Okay, so there's not a one size fits all question, uh, answer to that. Uh, the the first part is trying to understand why there is a, either objection um, to the idea of of public art. Now, uh, some people think, yeah, it is a waste. Some people say, oh, it's a waste of money, what, or I don't like this. So there's a few reasons why people uh, don't like the idea of public art. One is why should my community spend money on this thing that I don't understand, that I don't get? The, the short answer is um, I don't necessarily get all this stuff too, but I know that people with money do. Uh, that we know, and there's, there's research done by, uh, audience participation research done by the National Endowment for the Arts, that the more that the wealthier you are, the better educated you are, the more likely you are to participate in artwork, the more likely you are to to enjoy artwork. If we look at some of the wealthiest communities in uh, the United States and around the world, two of the things that we see are uh, greenery and artwork. Uh, so. Another, uh, you know, uh, uh, another concern that some people have is, oh, it's some weird stuff, and you know, I don't want any, I don't want to keep walking past some weird, blah. and you say, well, that's why we're going to design it together. So it's not going to be some weird, you know, weird artist just coming in and slapping paint on the wall and doing what. It's gonna. We're gonna work on it. So it's gonna be something that represents you. Uh, I, I, a friend of mine, muralist, uh, was asked to do a mural for a VFW, and the members now veterans of foreign wars. You know, old crusty guys, uh, and you know, he was wondering, well, what can I do with these? You know, what what would make, you know. What would make them want to enjoy, you know, you know, I can't do any really weird stuff with them. So what do you do? He painted, what did they want? He asked them what they wanted. They wanted a mural of the American flag. That's what he painted. And you know what? They love it. So um, now the question of money. Um, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to come from the public coffers. Um, you can, you know, in fact, uh, you can have local banks, local nonprofits uh, do the artwork. In fact, what I would say is, don't make it your idea. Um, in the sense that it's what you're better off if you're responding to a request from a local arts organization or from local artists. Now you can bring the local artists together and say what would make this place a better place for you to live and work and create and they might say more public art and then you could respond to that. But then it's not on you, you are responding to community input. I don't know of a single community anywhere where everybody is against public art. Um, it's just people get really nervous. People worry about what's going to happen and what's it going to look like. Because in America, especially, the word art for for too many for a lot of people is some kind of weird thing that I don't get. And when they see that everybody enjoys something, that um, people enjoy places that are fun, that look good, uh, that make them feel good. Nobody's ever against that. And so that's that's the approach I would take. Thank you. Hey, it's 2.30. We got to wrap up. Okay. So I think uh, we'll close up shop. There, Leo, there are so many questions that we did <laughs> not get to. So everyone, go ahead and bombard Leo's email uh, and uh, phone box uh, yeah. with all of your questions because, frankly, they're awesome questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, please, so please sorry. do. I'd love, I'd, 
I, I would love to know what my colleagues in, uh, you know, I, I'd love to know because as the, you know, what we do at the NCCP is in terms of our workshops, webinars, and other learning activities, is we want to respond to what people are asking about. So please let 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 me know. That's uh, I don't know that I'll be able to answer every question in a timely manner, but I will do my best. Thank you. And folks, just as a reminder for all of those law-related questions in placemaking, um, we do have another webcast coming up sponsored by the Urban Design and Preservation Division on September 6th, and it is Creative Placemaking and the Law. And uh, we are going to be applying that for one and a half CM credits law credits so uh, registration is not open yet the link is not there on our webcast webpage but it will be soon make sure you like us on facebook and uh, visit our webcast webpage ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast to get all the updated information and it becomes available leo thank you again for joining us we appreciate your time and your thoughts and your oh. funny comments too <laughs> Oh, and, thank you. No, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. It's, 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 it's really an honor to be asked to talk about these things. And uh, um, I, I hope you'll follow up with the resources that I, I mentioned, the, the wonderful people working in this field. And the, you, you can learn so much more from them than you can from me. Well, thank you. And thank you to the Urban Design and Preservation Division for sponsoring today's session. And of course, Margaret Rifkin from the division for helping out as always. So, hey, everyone, have a great weekend. Stay cool. And <laughs> we will talk next time. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.